One of the elements that you will typically see in the introduction section of research articles are things like the purpose statement. Why did the researchers produce this study? You'll also sometimes see research questions. And if you're looking at a quantitative study, you may also see specific hypotheses related to the study. So let's go through each of these elements of common research study articles and see and learn more about them. So first of all, let's look at a purpose statement or this statement of purpose. I want you to think about essays that you've written or speeches that you've written before. Typically you have a thesis statement or like a main idea, topic sentence, whatever you wanna call it, but it basically kind of boils down everything you're gonna say into why are you saying it? That's essentially what is happening with the purpose statement or a statement of purpose. Sometimes you'll hear these called research objectives, there's different language that we use, but the intent is still the same. It's why are we doing this type of study? Depending on whether you're looking at a quantitative or a qualitative study, your statement of purpose is gonna look a little different. So with a quantitative study, these are some of the things that you're typically gonna see. First of all, if a purpose statement is well-written and well-formulated, you should be able to see the study variables. What are the types of data that the researchers are collecting? So is it um, someone's stress level? Is it someone's socioeconomic status indicators? Is it someone's systolic blood pressure? What variables or what data are we going to collect? In addition, we're going to usually be collecting more than one thing. So our purpose is going to tell the reader how are we going, what kind of possible relationships or associations might we see between these variables? What are, why are we interested in these variables and what are we looking for? And then lastly, you should also be able to decipher who the population of interest is, such as are we looking at pediatric children who are um, uh, going to some sort of outpatient clinic? Are we looking at um, people in labor in the second or third stages of labor? Are we looking at individuals who have been diagnosed with this, some sort of stage four oncological cancer situation? So who are we studying? All of those types of things should be able to be viewed in a well-written quantitative purpose statement. To find these things, usually you're looking in the introduction of an article toward the beginning, and it is typically gonna be actually at the very end of the introduction as it's about to move into the methods or the material and methods section of the article. Um, typically it's right there in that transition area. <clears throat> and they're gonna use words like the purpose of this study was, or perhaps you'll see the aim, objective, or the goal of this study is. As a side note, typically the objective, aim, goal, purpose, whatever you wanna call it, is also noted pretty high up in the abstract of the study as well. So you should also be able to look in the abstract and see this information. But sometimes they'll go into more depth and have like two, like a dual purpose if you look actually in the article. So that's better to look there than it is to look in the abstract only. So here's an example of a quantitative study and what the abstract would look like. So at this point we see kind of one of those keywords, aim. So these researchers were aiming to examine, examine the effects of aromatherapy massage on the severity of neuropathic pain and quality of life. And I just took a snapshot of this article. Earlier in the article, they explained the background behind these things, reviewed some of the literature that had already been published, and also obviously explained what these acronyms meant. Also, you see a hypothesis here. If there is going to be a hypothesis or specific research questions, they're typically located in around this same area, right around the purpose, aim, goal, objective of the study. Typically at the very end of the introduction of the article. Um, there's some overlap, but with qualitative, you're going to see a few different things. Specifically, you're going to see the group or the setting of interest, which is different. We don't necessarily always cue in on it, the setting as much as in quantitative as we do in qualitative. But what is our phenomenon of interest? Um, are we looking at the transition between a student and a new grad nurse? Are we looking at that process of learning? You've just been diagnosed with an um, autoimmune disorder. What phenomenon are we interested in? 
And then depending on the language included in the research purpose statement, you can kind of figure out if the research is belonging to one of the main quantitative, mm -mm, qualitative study traditions such as ethnographic research, phenomenologic research, or grounded theory. If so, they'll use common words such as you see here. Um, that's not a, always the rule, but that's pretty common that you would see those. So here's an example. Here's that keyword, aim. So I know I'm looking at the purpose statement. This study aimed to understand the perspectives of PICU nurses who provide palliative care to children and the children's families and to understand the contextual factors associated with the nurse's experience. So I see some experience and perspectives. This was probably a phenomenological order or article, or it could have been a descriptive qualitative study. We would have had to have looked at more than just two sentences to figure that out. So research questions. Most articles that you're going to look at, study articles, are not explicitly going to list the research questions. The main reason is that many manuscripts are severely limited on the number of pages or the number of words that the publisher will give you. And since research questions are often a rephrasing of the purpose statement, just in the question format, um, that's space that we don't necessarily need to use as we're trying to get something published. So it's kind of presumed that you could figure out what the research questions were by reading the purpose statement. But every so often you will find studies like this screenshot where you will literally see the research questions. But just know that that's not typical in a standard manuscript. If you were looking at something like someone's published master's thesis or someone's DMP um, project or a dissertation, then there's lots more room and you will see all of these things in there. So now we're going to, the rest of this presentation is going to go over hypotheses. And so we just want to kind of dig into that a little bit. These are just some basic concepts to know about research hypotheses. So a hypothesis, if you remember back from maybe when you learned about the scientific method and one of the steps of the traditional scientific method is to develop a hypothesis. And you probably learned once upon a time that a hypothesis is an educated guess. That's still what it is, even in nursing research. It's an educated guess or an expectation of how our study's variables are going to interact with one another in our study. And I have lots of examples toward the end of this video, so don't panic. Stay tuned. Um, specifically, if especially if it's an interventional study, we're going to see suggested predicted relationships between an independent variable and a dependent variable. That's the IV and DV in, in my slide. Also, these are being used, uh, we use hypotheses to test um, to answer our research questions using statistical methods, which we'll discuss a little bit later. Um, note my note on the slide. Hypotheses are typically only exclusively used in quantitative research, um, mostly because hypotheses are stating relationships or proposed relationships between variables. Variables connote that we're measuring something numerically. So, um, and they're being tested by statistics. So typically that quantitative. The only time that um, that's going to be different is if there's some sort of mixed method study that pairs both quantitative and qualitative together in some sort of way in the same study article. And if you see that, then you might see some qual qualitative stuff and they still have hypotheses. But the hypotheses are connected to the quantitative part of the study typically. So there's different ways that we can break apart hypotheses and explain what they mean and the types of, of hypotheses. So one of the ways that we can separate them is either directional or non-directional. So typically what you see is a directional hypothesis. That's kind of a standard form format. And with a directional hypothesis, the researcher specifically says which direction they expect their relationships to interact with each other such as, as variable A increases, variable B is also going to increase, okay? That's a positive correlation or a positive relationship. Alternatively, they might say as a variable A increases, variable B is going to decrease, and that's a negative or an inverse relationship. But you're looking for keywords such as greater, less than, higher, lower, 
increase, decrease, and those kinds of things tell you the direction that they expect the relationships to go. And so that is a directional hypothesis. On the flip side, if you don't see those words and you see more vague phrasing, such as there is, there is a relationship between variable A and variable B, how? How are they related? I don't know. It's because there's no specific direction of the relationship. It's just vague. So that's a non-directional hypothesis. A hypothesis, And that's not the typical way you see them written, but sometimes researchers do um, have a few of those mixed in their study. So we can separate hypotheses out directional and non-directional. Here's a second way that we can kind of tease them out, simple versus complex. So if we only have one independent variable and how we expect it to interact with one dependent variable, then that is considered a simple hypothesis one and one. Anything more than that and it becomes a complex hypothesis, such as I gave you some examples. We could presumably have one independent variable that is impacting more than one dependent variable. Conversely, we could have more than one independent variable interacting with one dependent variable. That's very, very common in statistical modeling. And then we can have all kinds of stuff happening. We could have two independent variables. We could have five dependent variables, but it's somehow it's more than one and one, and that makes it complex. And then the other type of way that we can break apart hypotheses is research hypotheses and null hypotheses. Um, a research hypothesis is what the researcher actually thinks is going to happen. That is what they think the answer to their research question is going to be and what they expect the results to show them after all statistical testing. However, we can't really test that with statistics, the way statistical, statistical testing works. So we have this other little thing called a null hypothesis. Some people refer to it as a statistical hypothesis. It's the same thing. But basically, it's the absence of a relationship between the variables or the opposite relationship that we anticipate seeing with our research hypothesis. It's a little confusing. If you've taken a statistics course before, you should have learned this, um, but it's still kind of confusing. The whole purpose of this is just to allow us to evaluate things statistically to see if our null hypothesis is supported or not supported by the data that we receive from our participants. So here's an example, and this is on something in my research wheelhouse that I'm interested in studying. So presumably, we have a test of research study, and one of the research questions is, is there a relationship between final semester pre-licensure BSN students level of imposterism and their perceived level of clinical practice preparation? So you can see that you can tell who my population is, BSN pre-licensure final semester students. You can also see my two main study variables, which is imposterism and perceived level of practice preparation. So I have two, hypo two variables rather. What I think is actually gonna happen based on my data for my study is that there is gonna be a significant relationship between those two things. I, I would think that if a student has higher levels of imposterism, that's going to change how they view themselves of being um, prepared for practice. So the null hypothesis is exactly the opposite. There is not going to be a significant linear relationship between those two variables. And then the statistical test I would use to check for this in this instance um, would be a Pearson's R correlation coefficient or some other non-parametric correlation test. Um, another example <clears throat> that shows a little bit of different nuance, say that in that same kind of wheelhouse, here's my second research question, is there a difference in final semester pre-licensure BSN students level of imposterism when compared between students who have worked in healthcare prior to or during their academic programs and students who have not? So I'm interested in work experience and if that changes the student's perceived level of imposterism. And so my hypothesis, my research hypothesis, is going to say that there will be a difference in mean imposterism scores between those who do have work experience and those who don't have work experience. So presumably, and I could have made this um, directional, and I could have said that I felt like imposterism scores would be higher in people who did not have work experience 
versus those who did. So it's, this is just my example. <clears throat> so my null or statistical hypothesis is the exact opposite. I said that there will be a difference. Um, yeah, there will be a difference. That means mean A does not equal mean B. Whereas my null says there will not be a difference. That means both means are going to be equal. That's how I would test it statistically. Important notes just concerning the language of research. We don't prove or disprove hypotheses. All of this is based on probability. Probability is not perfect. We're never going to be 100% certain of anything um, when it comes to the rules of probability. So instead of using words like, well, this hypothesis was proven or our study proved that, no, we're probably correct. So we're going to say something like our hypothesis was supported by the study data or our hypothesis was not supported by the study data. So here's some examples just to wrap up to kind of put into place the different hypothesis examples that I told you. So my example, first example hypothesis, age, number of medical diagnoses, and the number of medications affect the incidence of falls in older adults. For me, what I find helpful is first, I like to kind of screen out the population. Who were the people being investigated? In this example, is older adults. So we know that's not a variable because everybody in the study was an older adult. So that's a constant. So that can't be one of the variables I'm looking at. So now I'm looking at age, medical diagnoses number, and the number of medications, and the incidence of falls. So I have a lot going on here. So the way this is written is that falls is kind of acting as a dependent variable. And what is acting upon falls, what is influencing the falls are age, number of medical diagnoses, and number of medications. So this isn't cause and effect, but I am showing direction of influence. I'm saying that variable A, B, and C are going to influence fall incidents. So is this simple or complex? It's complex. I have three independent variables or um, three independents and one dependent. Directional or non-directional, do we see any of those words that indicate direction, such as more or less? No, we don't. So this is non-directional. It is showing that there is going to be a relationship there because these things are going to affect the falls, but we're not showing how specifically they're going to affect falls. So, so far we know it's complex, we know it's non-directional, and we also can say that this is a research hypothesis because it is showing that there is going to be a relationship between variables one, two, and three and the dependent variable. So complex, non-directional research. The next one, there is no relationship between seatbelt use and head injury and auto accidents. So first we have to figure out what our variables are. And in this example, it's a little different, but seatbelt use and head injury. Okay, auto accidents is part of the population, people who have experienced auto accidents. So that's not a, that's a constant, not a variable. So we're trying to say that there is no relationship between seatbelt use and head injury. So we know that that's simple because there's one in one. And we also could say that this is probably null based on how it's written, because we're saying that there is no relationship. So presumably that's the, the statistical hypothesis that the um, researchers would be testing. Okay, here's one more. Women who undergo emergency cesarean section will have higher cortisol levels than women who deliver by the vaginal route following spontaneous labor. So first of all, directional or non-directional, I see a keyword, higher. So it's telling us the direction that we expect things to go. That means this is directional. So now we kind of need to figure out what's our independent variable or variables and what is our dependent variable. Um, in this instance, the method of birth, the mode of birth would either be emergency or vaginal. That's one thing. So that mode of birth is our independent variable. And then our dependent variable is cortisol levels. So we have one independent, we have one dependent, so that means it is simple. So right now we are at directional and simple, and then we definitely have a research hypothesis here because we're showing that there is going to be a specific relationship 
um, and which way it's going. <clears throat> the last example, there is a difference in depression and anticipatory grief levels in older women who have undergone reminiscence therapy when compared to those who have not. So first of all, is this directional or non-directional? Do we see any specific directional words? No. So this is non-directional. I'm saying that there is a that there is a relationship here, but I'm not telling you how. So it's non-directional. And now we need to figure out what our independent and dependent variables are. So first of all, our population is older women who have oh, older women. Okay, so that's not a variable. The independent variable is reminiscence therapy. That's one thing. Yes or no, did they go to reminiscence therapy? And then the dependent variables, there are two of them. Depression is one and anticipatory grief levels is two. So we know that that is complex because there is one independent and two, com uh, two dependents. So hopefully this is helpful. I do have another hypothesis video on my YouTube channel that has much more examples that I think would be helpful if this is not um, obvious, not apparent, and it's kind of confusing. Please watch that other video. I think you will find it helpful. Otherwise, thanks for watching.